My name's Jo Sykes. So this week's session, we're thinking about some of the theories and tools about composition and perspective when creating our own paintings. And four of us from the society are going to share some of our tips from our different perspectives as artists. But before I launch into my part, I just want to tell you about a couple of videos that I found on YouTube that I found really helpful. They're by a fine artist called Jill Poyard. Now, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce her surname, but you can see how it's spelt here if you want to look her up. On her channel, she's got two, she's got lots of good videos actually, but the two I'm mentioning here, one's called Developing an Eye for Landscape Composition, and the other is called The Art of Reconstructing Compositions. And I've found these two videos really helpful. Um, I've watched them a couple of times so far, and I'll keep going back to them because I want to keep learning and embedding some of that learning into my own artwork and developing my own skills. But I found her approach really clear and precise and that she's got some really good images on the videos that help to understand what she's talking about. So I would certainly recommend that you have a look at those and I'll put the links for them onto the programme so that you can access them really easily. So I like to paint um, a category that I call moorland and wild spaces and I'm really drawn to um, scenes where there's quite dramatic changes in the landscapes, different shapes, um, different textures with the rocks and grasses and things like that. So these are three examples of the sort of paintings that I've been working on recently that give you an idea of where I'm coming from. So from what I've learned so far, my approach is when I go out on walks, I take lots and lots of photographs from lots of different positions um, and different angles. And then I can bring all that reference material back into the studio and put the photos onto the laptop to review them. So as an example of this, from a recent walk I did at Wesenden Head Reservoir, this particular angle and view really caught my eye because of the um, position of the reservoir nestled in the hills, um, the background, the shape of the hills and the ravines, and some really pretty foreground. So I've decided to work with this photo and see what I might want to tweak and look at how I might put this into a painting. Now I have some limited um, knowledge and experience with Photoshop at the moment, but I can use that to just pinpoint a few things. So the first step I did was to crop the photo a little bit um, to just start and look at some of the key points of composition. For example, here you can see we've got a high horizon, which is quite nice in a painting to have, to have either a high horizon or a low horizon. And because there's so much information I want to um, put into the painting about the landscape and the shapes, we've got a nice high horizon here. We've also got some nice background detail, which I can use to create a bit of perspective and depth in the painting. So that's good. Um, and there's a nice big f foreground um, area in this um, photo that's got some really pretty grasses and some um, pretty detail that I can pick out. And then um, quite a substantial mid-ground where there's a lot of the um, activity and detail occurring around the different shapes of the hills and the ravines and where the reservoir sits. So we've got quite a lot of good stuff going on in this photo already. Um, what I've started to do here is highlighting and thinking about where my main focal point will be. And for me, it seems to be this point in the top right hand corner where the dam meets the hills on the other side. So because you've got that straight line of the dam, it contrasts quite sharply with the soft organic shapes of the hills and the ravines. Um, and if I bring in some of the 
darker tones from the shadow of the hillside. I can get some nice contrast there, which should work as a really good focal point. Um, the afternoon that I did the walk, the sun was coming from, it was quite a weak sunlight, so there wasn't some very strong shadows, but it was coming from the top right hand side. And in this photo here, I've just started to identify where some of the darker tones might be because of the direction of the light. I've also started to identify some other focal points and where I want the eye to move around the painting. So um, here we've got um, where the reservoir meets the land and the hills on the left hand side. And then there's a nice bit in the ravine here coming towards the foreground where the different hills dip down and meet into the ravine with the different tonal changes. And then there's some other points of interest um, with the pathway going around the hillside, the shapes of the hills and the grasses in the front. But the key focal points do make a nice triangulation shape which is another good composition tool to move the eye around the painting to those interesting points. And I've also noted here that with the lie of the land and the ravine and the hills, there is an S shape building which leads the eye into the painting and around the painting. And that's another good compositional tool to bring in. So that's, I can use that and work that up a little bit more. And then finally in Photoshop, I've changed the photo into a black and white and nudged up the contrast a bit so that I can really help myself to identify where the tonal changes are and where the really dark and the really light, light tones are. And some of those I might exaggerate or change a little bit to improve that composition. So spending a bit of time with the photograph like this has helped me to identify a lot of things about the composition and the things that I want to tweak and change a little bit or exaggerate to make the painting really work. From there then I do some sketching, not necessarily very detailed sketches, but this initial one, I just started to draft out the things that I'd seen in that original photograph. But I didn't do a lot with this sketch because I could quickly see that there was too much emphasis on the detail on the right hand side and it didn't balance with detail on the left hand side. So with this second sketch, what I've started to do here is, this is more detailed, but I've started to make some changes to where key points sit within the, the sketch. So the first example is I've moved things down a little bit because the first sketch was showing um, too much foreground, which was out of balance with the amount of midground where a lot of the detail is going on. So I brought the horizon down just a little bit and then stretched out a little bit the midground so that I've got plenty of area to describe the details I want to include. On the right hand side, I've established, excuse me, I've established my main focal point with that really straight line of the dam meeting the softer, curvier, organic edges of the hills, but also started to identify with tonal changes that as a key focal point. And then there's the straight line of the path going around the hillside again, which makes some really interesting shapes in that corner, and I think that will be a nice main focal point. For this interesting focal point on the left hand side, because my main focal point sits nicely in the third on the right, this point I've moved over so that it sits roughly around the third on the left hand side to balance that out. And I've slightly exaggerated um, the shapes of the hill coming down to that focal point, so it just makes that a little bit more dramatic. There's another interesting point here, which I decided as I was doing the sketch 
to really um, exaggerate the shapes of the hills and the ravines because it created just such an interesting little vignette within the painting. Um, so um, I've moved it slightly to the right so it's not dead in the centre, it's just off centre to the right hand side and I will exaggerate the shapes of the hills and the ravines a little bit there. And then the third focal point coming towards the foreground here, again, we'll, I'll slightly exaggerate the shapes of the hills and the ravines and make sure I use some good tonal changes to make that stand out because it's not quite as much detail there. In this foreground area, I've started to identify with the pencil lines, the direction that the land is, is forming and flowing. And with the, um, the shading started to identify um, where I want some of the tonal changes to describe the shape of the land, but also to um, indicate where the light's coming from and to create some contrast between very light and very dark areas. And you can see, um, you might be able to see where I've, I've just slightly exaggerated, um, again, the shapes of the, the hillsides. I've identified here that for the foreground, I'm going to leave the middle bit a little bit more, um, or shall I say, less detailed to lead the eye in. To put a little bit of detail on the right hand side for interest, but most of the detail of the grasses will be on the left hand side, so that we balance the painting on both sides with the amount of detail. Doing all that preparation really helped me to understand the view that I planned to paint and to become familiar with the changes I wanted to make on the canvas. I know it sounds like an awful lot of work, but in reality, I found that the more I keep reviewing tools of composition, the more they get embedded in my mind and my thinking and become intuitive. And I think that's the case for experienced on plain air painters such as Karen Whitwam. Karen loves to paint the sea and anything to do with the coast. And the first of her paintings here is at Newlyn Harbour in Cornwall. The second painting is a really evocative one of Venice in the rain. And the last one is a still life that Karen has set up in her studio. I met Karen very early one morning in the summer on one of our outdoor painting days at Blackmore Foot Reservoir. And I asked her why she'd chosen the view that she had and how she'd planned to paint it. I've picked this uh, view because of the wills and apps to give it some sense of scale. Mm -hmm. Also, I've got it in thirds on the canvas and I like the dark and the light. I always look for dark and lights, mm -hmm. but I didn't want this in the middle of my painting. Yeah. So, but it gives it a bit of sense of scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And what we do about the foreground, Karen, then, because with a vast stretch of water, it's difficult to. Well, I'm not. I'm, I've got just. A th I've just got a bit of it at bottom. Yeah. I haven't yeah. got the whole of this. Yeah. It's impossible yeah. to get. You've just to prioritise which bit you want in, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's why I've chose this, mainly for that, to give it a sense of scale. Yeah. It's in thirds on my canvas. I've got a lot of dark here in trees. And at the moment, light's on that at back. As the sun moves round, it'll be at back of them hills. Mm. So mm. early morning's best it's time. best time, yeah. yeah. So I'm starting putting all my darks in first. That's one thing I always do, yeah. put my darks in first. So do you often go out early morning yeah. painting? Yeah. <clears throat> you find that's the best time? Best time or late evening, yeah. yeah. So 
So I'm just putting all my darks in, really. Mm -hmm. And I'm just blocking in, yeah. so I know where everything is. Yeah. Are you working on paper or board there, Karen? Board. Board. Board, yeah. And I've, I've pre-coloured it. I, I just put something on it. I don't like a white canvas. Mm. Some trees here. So basically, I'm just putting all my darks in, and then um, I'm just trying to get my boat covered, basically. Yeah. First. So hello, I'm Linda Downs, I think most of you probably know me already. Um, I'm an urban sketcher, um, I spend, a, I probably sketch every day um, and often as possible I sketch outside. Um, I like to sketch buildings, um, uh, oh, the older the building the better really, I'm not really keen on modern buildings, I like to, I like to sketch in townscapes. Um, and my main materials that I use are, are pen and watercolour and I generally work on um, a cardi paper which is a handmade Indian rag paper which is um, beautiful, takes lots and lots of layers of colour. This is a commission that I've done for a friend of mine who has a fabulous garden. Some of you may know it. I was going to cover the name up but I haven't done. Um, anyway, she's moving so she asked me if I would um, paint some pictures of her house and I thought the best way to do it was with a sketchbook and then I could go up whenever the weather was right and also throughout different seasons to make sketches of her of her garden and her house so this is the house again these are all ink and watercolour and this is the cardi paper that I was talking about earlier fabulous this estate I, I don't know if any of you have been it's part of the National Garden scheme but probably won't be anymore because she's moving but it's just the most beautiful garden it's got an orchard that's just a tiny tiny corner of the orchard and um, it's the, you know lots of nice perspective lines here this is the this is the um, the stream that runs through and, and it's a it turns into quite a large lake but unfortunately it was very, very muddy on that day, hence the, the brown colour. Gorgeous yard with uh, wisteria growing over. Sycamore around the base of the tree. And then it was there in the autumn when the Virginia creeper was at its best. And the pears were ripe. <laughs> And then she wanted me to come back. This is um, spring this year with the, the wisteria, which is just wonderful. I don't think I've captured it quite as well as I could have done. Oh, this one's upside down. 
think it makes the book more exciting if one page is the wrong way up. Um, so this is looking across the pond. There's lots of splattering here. I like, I like splattering. I'm a bit of a splatterer. There's another... Actually, that one isn't from that one isn't from life, and I think you can really tell. Um, I did that from a photograph that I'd done taken years ago. This is probably the most recent one I've done. It's too much green, too much green. I've chosen Hepworth um, and this particular scene uh, because I really like the perspective of it, and also I like the contrast between the row of houses and a little bit of green that comes down the middle of the lane. I've done a bit of a recce round. I've been to various sites in the village um, and I've ended up choosing this one uh, for several reasons really. One, it's at the end of a track and there's no people walking past if I'm lucky. So I've um, got a bit of privacy and I don't have people looking at what I'm doing. But also I really like this scene because um, it's great to illustrate perspective. Um, you know the lines of the the lines of the houses, the base and the roof of the houses. Um, fantastic, going into the distance and meeting my eye line. I also got the dry stone wall, which I always like to have a dry stone wall in. I'm quite, I'm quite um, inspired by Paul Talbot Graves and his massive walls that he has in the foreground. Um, and then I've got, as well as the the angles that are going into the distance, I've also got some some planes that are coming flat across like the gate and the side of the house is coming straight flat in front of me face on in front of me so it gives a little bit more interest I like the grassy track I like the greens down the middle and the tree in the background so that's really why I've chosen this site so when I'm planning out my drawing and perspective is important I tend to use a clock face um, you can see I've got a circle that's the clock face there and my eye line is at 9.15 and then when I plot my angles, say the roof of the houses or the, the, um, the line of the houses as they go down into the distance, I use the clock face to, to determine what angle um, I'm going to use. So the, the, my, my eye comes down there, it's at 10.30, so that roof line is at 10.30 and the baseline here at 8 o'clock. Um, I've got another line going out here of the wall, takes me out at about, I can't really see it, about 5.30. So I use that a lot. I, pl I plot my angles according to the clock face. I actually got this from somebody who came to Huddersfield Art Society, I think, who talked about using the clock face. So when I start my composition, um, I, I start to consider what I'm going to do. I first of all use a viewfinder so as I can get an idea of how much I can actually fit in. And also it gives me a great idea about the proportions, you know, how tall a building is in comparison with the tree in the background. So the building on the left hand side, um, you know, has the same height on the page as the tree. Um, the roof um, facing me at the end of the lane is three quarters of the way up my, um, my composition. Um, and then I start, I start to sketch and plot in my angles using the clock face idea. So when I look at the rooftops here, I'm looking at actually uh, probably about 10 o'clock. And when I look at the bottom of the houses, then the angle is more like 8 o'clock. My eye line is at quarter past 9 and the, the wall topping is just a fraction over that. It's a fraction more towards 13 minutes past nine maybe rather than a quarter past nine so that's um it's one of the it's a really good tool i think also for lining up the windows and everything all the bottom of the windows coming out at the same angle which is somewhere between eight o'clock and nine o'clock so probably about half past eight coming out at that angle um,
then I will get to a point at some point when I put some watercolour on. What I normally do is a bit of watercolour, a bit of ink, a bit more watercolour, a bit of ink. Um, but now I'm just defining the composition a little bit more. Right, there's my wall. Stones, I love the different positioning of stones in dry stone walls. And obviously this, I am not drawing every stone accurately. I am giving an impression of full mm. toppings. And bearing in mind my eye line as well. So This wall's got a bulge in it. It's not just a, just doesn't stand up vertically and it bulges out in places so it'd be nice if I could try and get an impression that it bulges. Um, another thing that I do which is pretty obvious I guess is that I just flit around from one from one piece of the drawing to the other Some of these windows really fascinate me because they're quite low down. In fact, that's a window. It looks more like a door, but it's a window. Some vegetation. Some weeds, etc. <laughs> Going up the side of the houses. Here's my first drain pipe coming a bit stronger now. It's got that thing at the top, that little round thing that stops the leaves falling down it. Now put it in the wrong place, it's crashing into that window, but never mind. Flatten out again. See, I've got, I'm really not unhappy with that as a sky, and that's just the tiniest, tiniest mm. little bit of colour. It doesn't need, take much, does it? No, that'd be fine. There's the sky done. I could, in, in this wall, I'm probably going to drop, just drop colour in again. So more water than anything else, and then it just drops some colours in on top of it. So I might use a little bit of Payne's Grey. It's very blue Payne's Grey, this one. Mm. It's amazing how different they are depending on um, which manufacturer you use. I don't know which this is. A few shadows on the wall.
Hello everyone, I'm Shirley Waddington and my favourite medium to do artwork is ink. I love doing ink drawing and I particularly love drawing old buildings. Uh, I studied architecture at college and I just love old buildings. So any challenge that can possibly <laughs> involve a building, I uh, make it do so. Um, I like to draw them outside and then bring them back and do the ink over the top of the pencil. Um, but if I can't do that, then I use photographs, uh, as you'll see. Right, just killer drawing. Uh, I wanted to show because it's an example of one that I did a long time ago in sepia as a, a summer scene, and then recently I altered it to make it into a Christmas card. So. Um, I added the snow and the robins, of course, and changed it to black and white because I thought that would show, show the snow better mm. than uh, the sepia would. And that's, that's why that's I wanted lovely. to include that. Amazing detail. That is a picture that I copied from a book, yeah. the original, yeah. but I just liked it. Um, this one, I chose this to use as an example of one where a full frontal uh, drawing, flat front on perspective more or less, is, is a good idea because it's got varying heights, it's got foliage to frame it and it's interesting enough um, to get away with doing it as a full frontal mm. when an ordinary house would look boring. Mm. Yeah. So this one um, I've included to show how perspective can be used to add interest by looking down on a, a row of cottages and um, it made it difficult to draw of course but I think it really adds interest and uh, draws the eye down the row of cottages. Mm, stunning. Thank you. So <clears throat> looking at perspective, if you're going to draw a building what I always do is I walk right round the building, go all and look at it from every angle because if you look at a building face on, which I've called full frontal, um, just an ordinary house is a little bit boring. It, it just looks like a child's drawing. So if you can go around and try and see it from a nice interesting angle, um, that can make a better composition. Um, the only time that is not the rule is when you get a really big impressive um, building like this that's so magnificent that even full on it's got lots to look at and uh, interest. Mm. So that's the only time when I would say go full frontal. Mm. <laughs> okay, so that's just a if you were drawing that, then you don't have to worry about perspective lines or anything because as long as you get the horizontals horizontal and the verticals vertical, um, there's nothing to worry about there. Mm, yeah. Okay. So then, if we go on to single point perspective where the lines uh, eventually meet at one point, that is um, not too difficult because you can use that. Uh, you've got your eye line on the horizon and then use um, the, the angles of whatever you're drawing to lead you into the picture and hopefully meet at the other end. Mm. Like that one, because it's you've got a slightly different angle as well. That's a little bit more difficult. But those lines, the top there and the top of the bridge, the arches, would actually meet further over mm. if you continued them. So I don't know, the, the thing that I like to stress to people is that you probably have a really good eye. If you're interested in buildings and things looking at perspective, you've probably got a good eye and if it wasn't right, you would know. Mm. And then that would be the time when you'd get out your rulers and mm. check mm. what have I done, what have mm. I missed here, what have I done wrong. Mm. Um, and so I struggle with Shirley. Is um, so like that um, this middle one here, 
You can envisage where the vanishing point's going to. Yes. But when it's um, like the kitchen there, and yes. the vanishing point's way off, or the, that top right-hand one when yes. it's going to one side, yes. I struggle then to sort of think, where's that vanishing point? Yes. And then being able yes. to visualise. Is there anything you can um, advise about that? Well, uh, I suppose you could then, you know, you would get out the rulers uh, and just choose which one you think's right. Yeah. In that case, it would be that one because that's more or less horizontal. Uh, and extend it and then that one and extend that one. Right, yeah. Um, that's all you can do, really, if you think that's not just right, if it's not working. But, like you say, you would know something's not right here, mm -hmm. and you would um, step back and have another look at it. Yeah, yeah. So, trust yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, single point perspective, relatively easy. Um, like those, you can see where they're going there and there. Yeah. So, don't forget the the horizontal. Your eye level is where your lines are, are going to meet um, at, at the other end. Yeah. Now, when we get on to multi-point perspectives, that's where things get much more tricky because you've got. Uh, like this one, for instance, you've got the perspective of these buildings at the sides and then you've got some faces that are not along that plane. Uh, those are going that way, that's coming out that way. And then here, they're going round again. Mm. So there's so many things to um, trick you, really, into uh, making it, getting it wrong. So you really, you just need to break it down into the bits that you can see are the normal single point perspective, those, mm. and then get in the shapes for those and just work around. Um, I mean, sometimes if I'm drawing a building outside or even like that from a photograph, I just hold my uh, pencil or rule or whatever get the line and then keep that angle and bring it down to my work yeah is it? yeah it sounds yeah, simple but yeah. it does work so, so it's all about using your ruler and the angle of the ruler isn't it to help you yeah you it, yeah it's so simple but it really does work mm. Mm. Uh, and things like these if if these started to go astray um you can get on one that you know is more or less right and then pivot it all oh, right, yeah. So that helps as well. So yeah. you can stop at any point and, you know, maybe if yours are down, you think, oh, that's not right, let's move it up. And it's surprising how tiny adjustments make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and there you see these, because they're on a curve in the road, you've got a different, slight different perspective for each rooftop and each floor ground level uh, that's just a nightmare <laughs> and there it's on a hillside so a bit like that one I showed you from Kurt Burton um, you really need to look at each building separately mm -hmm. but again make sure they don't have the verticals going slanting yeah, yeah. just keep keep checking your verticals and as long as they're right and then you get the perspective from the mm the angles for the roofs. Um, just treat each one separately mm. as you go down mm. the hill. And the same there, you've got uh, some going down the hill, you've got the steps off at the angle there, you've got the path there, it doesn't follow the hill down. So you've got some down there that are on a different viewpoint. So it's all doable, but you just need to break it down into separate bits mm -hmm. um, when you've got the different points, different perspectives. And all these I've looked at have been buildings, but 
Oh, sorry. Um, the same applies if you're looking at other things, not just buildings. You've still got your multi-point perspective or your single point perspective. Look at the horses there. <clears throat> they're all actually at the same level but because they're going away, they're more or less matching the line of the roof there. Mm -hmm. So uh, curtains, windows, trees, even this, the um, pods on the wheel, because they're going further away and up, they get smaller. Yeah. So there's things like that to take into consideration. The shape, the, the distance between the windows gets smaller the further back you are. So you have to consider that. Um, use of tone, uh, things that are further away are much lighter mm -hmm. and strong, um, stronger tones are nearer the front. So if you want to accentuate like that, like Alan's done here with York Minster, make the front focal points really nice and strong, bright, strong colours. And the further back you go, like the hills there, like the background there, um, just lighten the tone mm -hmm. and that gives you that um, feel of distance. Uh, here, it's the shadow really, um, rather than tone in the distance, but the shadow tells you that that side is not on the same plane as the end of the building there. Mm. Um, these examples are looking at something either up or down and oh, right, yeah. like the row of building it, it affects the perspective so as well as the sideways perspectives you've now got one going up as well or going down so the same applies you could almost turn it on its side but um, the central vertical would be um, Actually, it doesn't look it. I think that's just because of the camera angle. Really, the centre should be vertical mm. and the others equally balanced either side of it, if, if it's the same each side. And there, look, you can see how the higher up it goes, the, the narrower. So it's like sideways perspective, only the other way up. Mm. So, again... If you're going to draw it like that, you would have to make sure your your centre vertical is like your view per eye, eye level uh, on a normal look of, of perspective. Um, so make sure your central one is vertical and then the others are going towards mm -hmm. the... Um, the vanishing point. Vanishing yeah. point would be right up in the sky, yeah. but... Yeah. That's what you're aiming yeah. for. And something like this, um, it's very difficult to use perspective with that. Uh, any rules about it, you just have to work it out by eye, I think. Mm. Trust in yourself, because there's too many elements to have you follow any rules, really. I suppose you'd just make sure the centre of it was um, balanced mm. by, by mm. being round a, a central vertical. Otherwise, it would topple over. Mm. And this looking down on the house a little bit means you see more of the roof, which you wouldn't see normally. So that would help with uh, reading that picture. Mm -hmm. and, and there you can see under those different levels, which you wouldn't if you were looking flat on it. So if you're going to add people to a drawing that's got quite a deep perspective, Remember that if they're all adults or more or less uh, eyes on the same level, their heads would all be in, in a line. Mm -hmm. Their body might be bigger if it's nearer and it will be smaller if it's further back. But remember that their eyes are all on one level. Mm -hmm. Obviously a child would be lower yeah. or someone in a wheelchair or whatever. Yeah. But generally eye level is on your eye level. So you would start off doing the heads first and then do the bodies appropriately to uh, how close yes, they are. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. 
Um, so I've just actually done one from start to finish from a photograph, mm -hmm. just to show the stages if anyone wants to have a go. Um, I think this might help to make it more straightforward. So I take the photograph, again, uh, this one I got off the internet because one of the 30 day challenges is something to do with space. So of course I had to find a building mm. <laughs> to do with space and this is the uh, Greenwich Observatory. So I took it from the internet, took the colour photograph to use later for tone and things and then did a black and white copy. So I just um, scribbled on the back to do a quick tracing and then I put it on the um, board on some paper and just got the basic outline to help me out. I mean uh, you can do it with a grid but it just takes so long it's much easier if obviously if you're doing it the same size. Um, so here there's just the very very basic lines mm. all right yeah but yeah that is enough mm -hmm. and then take away the tracing and start by referring to the color photograph start to join up the lines fill in the main shape of it mm -hmm. just with pencil and then when you think it's more or less right keep going keep adding more and more pencil lines and then when you think the pencil lines are right, start with the pen, mm -hmm. inking in uh, just the outlines to start with. And then carry on with the inking. But remember now, when it gets where you're actually putting down ink that's not uh, erasable, uh, start using the set square and check the verticals because it's so easy for them to go yeah. askew. So keep checking the verticals and having done that just keep filling in, filling in until you've got all the lines done. I, that's, I just took a photo of that to remind me. Uh, and the more strong ink you're putting in the more just be aware of possible lines going askew mm. um, and then just keep inking. When I got to this point I thought oh that open door, which it is open door so it's very dark, is too heavy so I couldn't really erase it so what I did was go around the whole thing again and increase the tone of the rest of it so it sort of balances Balance it out, out now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so that's more or less done there. Um, I use these ink pens, which are water soluble, mm -hmm. uh, and they have different sizes of nib. So for the very fine lines like these, uh, there's a not point not five. 0.05, very fine line, and then I use a 0.1 for the early drawing, and then when I want to add more strength, I use a 0.2, very rarely a 0.5, because mm. uh, mm. that's too dark, it, it yeah. jumps out at you too much. And um, just occasionally, if I make a mistake, I can use a, a white gel pen to go over a line. Yeah. Um, and what, what paper do you use, Shirley? Uh, I use good quality cartridge. Yeah. Yeah, if you try to do that on thinner paper, like um, photocopying paper, uh, it would actually, it could actually go through it. Yeah. Because you're putting yeah. a, lot, a lot of pressure on. Um, Can I just ask you, Shirley, how, yeah. long would, um, how long did that one take you to do? Um, well, I'd have to do it in bits because you go cross-eyed. Um, it probably took about three hours because mm. you do it all in pencil and then all in ink. So, in a lot of detail, obviously. 
you really have to look at it closely to see the amount of detail you've managed to yes. get in there. It's just, I, I just, I'm stunned at the work that you do, Shirley. Cause, um, <laughs> but it's a labour of love because I just, isn't that a gorgeous building? It is, yeah. It's absolutely yeah. stunning. Um, this one, it, uh, I went to Leeds Castle with my son and granddaughters recently, well, before the lockdown, mm. I think it was last autumn, and um, I loved that view, because again, it, it's not a, a full frontal, it would have been a bit flat and boring, but from that, this, you get two sides, and one side, heavy shadows, which brings out the other side of it, and um, and then you got the reflections in the water mm. so i thought that was lovely so i did a drawing of it started off inking it and i thought well that front is so beautiful catching the sun uh, i've got some gold watercolor paint so i use that to it doesn't work that well really but uh, it's worked well enough for me to think oh i might try that again yeah yeah so it's very effective yeah it's I've just noticed got a slight you've sheen. got sort of like the shadow is more purple, which again is really effective. Yeah. Well, if you look at a shadow, it's a sort of grey brown colour. Yeah. And it it's a little bit dull. Whereas um, it's Alan Goodall's taught me a lot about watercolour, mm -hmm. and he always uses crimson and um, ultramarine to make a purpley. Yeah. And yeah. it just gives it a warmth that that doesn't. And a bit of life to it, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's like the grass, he always uses a strut like an aureolin just to really, I mean, yeah, I would do it lighter anyway, but by adding that yeah. really strong yellow, you get that feel of the sun really catching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then I thought the trees hanging in front were lovely because A, they give it a bit of a frame, mm. and also they help with the distance because if the trees are like that, then that building's obviously a long way away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See. yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a good... Um, tip as well for buildings, um, but just a little um, uh, outdoor day we went on and they were just ordinary houses so I thought well it's a bit boring just doing the flat on so I did it from this angle seeing see two sides the roof and then put some of the overhanging trees in so that pushes the buildings back mm -hmm. and the trees in the background give it a sort of frame as well and mm. help to um, f fill up the space to make it look part of the landscape yeah uh, and the shadows as well I think their shadows always add um, a sort of real strength to a picture. Mm. I mean sometimes when I do an ink drawing I do fill in one side if there is a really strong shadow like mm. on the um, I mean that that it was a really bright day and that shadow came from the buildings on the right mm -hmm. and when I was doing it I thought oh blimey this might be a bit much mm. but actually I think it works mm. because it tells you that it, tell, it tells you a story about that day that the sun is shining so strongly on that building and uh, casting that shadow and, and these shadows all uh, echo that. Yeah, yeah. And I actually sat in the middle of the road to draw that. <laughs> well, that was the best angle. And the cars kept coming. I had to keep moving. <laughs> so I wonder I didn't get run down. Well, there you have it. Four quite different approaches, each with our own different tools and tips for looking at perspective and composition. So I'm hoping that it's been an interesting watch for you. Oh, and before I forget, here is my finished painting, which I decided to do as a watercolour, and I'm really quite pleased with the outcome. 
So I'm hoping that from all those tips and tools and hints that people have shared with you, you'll be able to pull out one or two things that you might want to use next time when you're planning your next landscape painting and thinking about your composition and looking at the perspective. And if you do do some paintings, please do send them in so that we can add them to our website for everybody to see. Bye for now.